So on the drawings, they don't designate this bottom part of the windowsill as having a different name. So that's probably just going to be how I refer to it in this video. But the way I built this was I broke it up into three parts, that top part of the sill, the decorative front that will sit on the brick wall, and then there's a spacer that you'll never see that all of this will, will be attached to. So that spacer is what I'm going to work on now. The spacer is essentially going to be screwed into the brick, and then the decorative part of the sill could um, hang off the front of that. And then the mantle, uh, the, the windowsill top that I made last week will set on top of that. That's essentially what I was doing. At this point, even though I'm hollowing out all these parts, I realized I was gonna be using more lumber than I thought. So I started making some of these parts that you wouldn't see. This, this is basically a spacer, um, a little bit thinner. So I decided to, to cut one of these boards in half and use the two thinner sides as my outer skins. And this is the exact same process as last week. Like I said, all of these parts are made like this with torsion boxes. So I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. Um, as I said last week, where these marks are, um, my grid spacing I tried to keep to about four inches, all of these pieces. But basically I'm making one part, uh, one piece, the original, all of my marks are the same off of that one, which will guarantee they line up. So that was, it's pretty simple stuff. Once you've done this a couple times um, with a dado stack and the radial arm saw, it goes fairly quickly. So once I had my initial grid in place, I'm gonna go through and make my spacers out of plywood. Now I built this at the same time I built the last part. So I was still kind of figuring out how I wanted this to go. I thought I might put some mortise and tenons in the front of this to attach that decorative part of the sill. I changed my mind about halfway through building it and you'll see how I decide to, to do it at the end. With the spacer in progress, I started working on the front in the same process. I was using some thinner material as well as some thicker material to, to build all of this out. The problem with these dimensions are none of them are truly standard. Um, that's one of the issues I had working off the drawings. And when I say issues, I mean I was very happy to have the drawings. They were extremely useful. The, I liked the design. But for example, some dimensions were an inch and an eighth. If I was making it, I probably would have made that a more nominal dimension so it's easier to get lumber in that size. So there was a lot of circumstances where I had to build up material. Um, but that was where the torsions boxes came in handy because I could get those those odd size thicknesses by just adjusting the size of the plywood. So that was another advantage to this design um, instead of having to laminate a bunch of stuff. So then for the, I'm working on the front decorative part of that sill now. So it's the same process. It's going to be two sides, a top and a bottom. The sides I made um, thicker than they're going to be and then I could cut them down later just like the top mantle I made last week and the exact same process going through cutting out these edge rabbits for solid wood and then go th going through and cutting out all the dados for the center which will be my torsion box grid so um, like I said I went through this pretty quickly because it's the exact same process and then there are all of my parts. So then, like I said in the last week, um, I decided to put fronts and backs on all of these, even though some of these you won't see. I didn't want water to get into the back of anything. So all of my parts are getting a rabbit on the front and the back. And these are always solid wood. So this wood came from Woodworker Source. It's 1316, so that's what I worked with. Um, like I said in the last video, I didn't mill up any of this lumber. This was, I could calculate it once this is done, but it was quite a substantial st stack of wood I've gone through for this. And having it pre-milled just saved me so much time, especially in a shop like mine without a lot of bigger heavy duty tools designed for, for milling lumber. So once I had this uh, box made, like I said, I made these oversized because it's, it's much easier to make them oversized and cut them down. And that's exactly what I did. Once I had that together, I could cut them down um, and, and then put it back together and I would have my, my final thickness for this. So that's what that looks like. And then I could just place these um, 
off to the side, I can measure the distance between those two dado grooves, and then I could cut all my plywood accordingly. So you can see like the dimensions are really based on how deep those dado grooves go, um, how thick your top is. So stuff like this, I just found it easier to build as I went, um, cut stuff down versus measuring everything out and, and making a cut list, which I don't think would have been super, super accurate. And then that is how that front part is going to go together. So I'm leaving the edges open because I'm going to put some tenons on those edges. And that's how I'm going to attach the two boxes on the edges, which are a little bit, they're a different dimension, which is why this isn't one solid piece. So I just cut these out of some scrap uh, Douglas fir I had laying around. And that's how that's going to go in place. And then there's also some decorative trim on this front. The trim. Um, on this project was one of the more challenging parts but the trim for this bottom part was one of the easier ones to make because it was pretty basic it was basically flat stock around that intersection and then just molded stock around the edges so like I said it's pretty simple um, just cutting this stuff down this one on the bottom is a little bit thicker than the one on the top so I'm just notching out the front um, and following the drawings, all of this, these cuts, all of these decisions are based on following the drawings as closely as possible. They gave me a little bit of artistic license with some of the moldings because they're so decorative. They said if a cove is a little bit thinner or thicker than in the drawings, that wasn't that big of a deal. But this is how that stock is going to sit on the front. And um, I milled all this stuff up, cut it all, and then once it's all final installed is when I'll attach the trim, which will be at the end. So then the next process is these two boxes that are on either side. All of these joints I decided to join with a lock miter bit. Um, the problem with that was, like I said, this lumber's 13 16 My lock miter bit only goes up to three quarters. I was not buying another one for this. So before I did anything with the lock miter bit, I had to trim a little bit of that material off. And then um, the, the pilasters, which will be the next week's video, is where I'm going to show more in depth this process of the lock miter bit. I set it up for those pilasters and then just used it for this. So I'm going through this pretty quickly. But that is essentially how that joint looks, especially on something that's going outside. I wanted a more solid joint than just miters. You do miters with splines that also work, but I had this bit, so it was worth using for this. Then as you can see in the drawing, there's, there's um, a notch cut out of the bottom, and then these edges are rounded over on the bottom as well. So before I glue this together, I laid out all the marks where the trim will go, and then I can mark where that notch is gonna be. And then these will also have plywood in them. So you can see I marked out on the back side for the plywood as well. Same process, cutting these on the radial arm saw. That's an extended stop I have on there. And that's what all of that looks like. And then I also want to cut out the back because this will have a backer as well. I didn't want to cut the bottom because you'll see it. So what I did for that was um, I had one of those oscillating tools in the shop. It's not going to be as accurate as, as a saw with flat fence and, and a flat tabletop. I've gotten pretty good at using one of these that I could just cut out these little notches with them. And then my backer will, will sit in place there. So these sides turn into pretty intricate pieces of wood because there's some more detailing that will be done on them as well. And that's how my box looks now. So then for the tenons, like I said, um, these edges, this isn't gonna, it's not gonna be as big a tenon as this. You can see I marked where I wanted to cut out the material and the shoulders on this. My camera didn't film the first cuts, but you can see I did two vertical cuts for the piece and then I could just cut off these little bits as well. This is the easiest way to do this. Now that it's a standalone piece, I haven't glued it in place on the table saw. And then those are my tenons. I still had this tool out, so I just cut off the edge excess with that as well. And then there is that piece. So that is in place. That's what's going to that look like. And I'll have to put a receiving mortise on these other pieces. And that's how that all will attach. So now that I had that in place was when I decided to glue this together. This, all projects are like this, but this one especially was one of those projects where 
timing was really critical. It's much easier to make adjustments to these parts when they're in pieces versus glued together. So it was a lot of figuring out when was the best time to glue something together because it's going to be its true form when it's glued together. A lot of times when you're doing woodworking, when stu gluing stuff together will change the dimensions slightly. So if you're working too much with unglued pieces, it could throw stuff off. So at that point was the best time to glue that front piece together, so that's what I did. At this point, I went back to the spacer. Um, you can see I added my edges in the back, and then I still left my plywood pieces long. This spacer will never see, which is why I used a butt joint in the back. And then, I, like I said, I changed my mind about how I was going to attach this. I decided to use a French cleat instead of mortise and tenons. So all those extended plywood pieces I had, I had to trim down. I honestly would rather overcut things and trim it than have messed this up the first go around. At this point, that front decorative section is coming out of the clamps. There's a lot of glue on it, but uh, sanding all this stuff quickly removes all of that. I added a very thin rabbit to the, the back side of that spacer, and then I could cut my French cleat. So that was pretty simple. It was just a piece of, this is all mahogany. This is um, all built out of mahogany. I could cut the cleat. I'll have one receiving end on the spacer, the other end on the back of that decorative front, and then this will just fit into place. So once that was done, I could finally glue this spacer together as well. Exact same process. You could see all the pieces. The only thing I did different with this one was I didn't put the French cleat in place yet. I was a little unsure of how well it was going to work, which I shouldn't be. French cleats usually work um, seamlessly. So I wanted to keep it loose in case I had to make any adjustments to how it was mounted. So you could see I'm basically making the sandwich, adding all of my pieces, but keeping that front part where the cleat's gonna go open, um, at least at this point. Same process, a lot of squeeze out with this sort of construction. So after it came out of the clamps, I could clean it up. And then that is how that cleat is going to fit in place. So then at this point, I could attach uh, these sides. So I'm using my fence as a straight edge. There's the tenon. I can mark where that tenon is. And then that is the mortise I'm going to cut out from the side of these. Pretty simple work with a mortising machine. If you don't have one of these, a drill press works really well. A router works really well. Um, I use, um, sometimes when I'm in a bind and it's not a super visible joint, I will also use just a, a hand drill to, to make these. And that is going to be my mortise. At this point, you can see it breaks through to the inside because some of these parts are really thin. So I will have to notch out some of the plywood um, dividers on the inside of this in order for it to fit. But then that slides on nicely. And that's how I, I decided to attach this. So this will be one whole unit once this is all glued together. And that is what that box looks like. And then at this point, I had to um, uh, cut out these these notches like I said that was already marked out on these so for this pretty simple I just uh, raised my blade to the depth I needed I cut a series of curves and then I could remove that material because this is going to also have to be filled in so there's not a gap in the bottom now this is kind of hard to see and it's going to make more sense once I attach this to the mantle but before I glued this together I added another little notch on the radial arm saw this essentially creates a ledge when this is glued together so I could put a piece of material in there you could see how there's now a gap you put a piece of material in there and that's how I'll attach it to the mantle but that will be down in a later video but that was one of the problems with this too you really had to think three steps ahead when building this because so so many of these parts have to be attached together um, and I would have done this even if I was working on site this is going to be transported obviously but it's a gigantic piece of furniture there's probably gonna have to be some adjustments on site so all these pieces being built so they're detachable I think is going to save um, a huge hassle uh, with installation which I'm assuming I am doing I didn't install the molding that I made for them a couple months ago, but I'm assuming I'm installing this. 
And then I could just glue those sides together and then I could glue them to the, the main piece. I did these one at a time just because they had to stay really straight and flat. You could see I have everything butted up my table against my table saw fence because if that's not perfect, when it attaches to the mantle, there'll be a gap. And you can see I also made a backer for this, which I don't permanently attach, um, but that is made. They're actually, it's actually still not permanently attached because um, like I said, I wanted access to certain parts of these pieces before I was finished building. And then, like I said, I had to build up this bottom so that I could carve into it. So all I did was attach some pieces to the inside. This is all type on three, so it's rated for exterior use. And there will also be a finish on this. So that will help extend the life of all these pieces. And that is what that looked like. At this point, I tested the French cleat to make sure it would work. I was happy with how it's set in place. None of this is permanently attached at this point. But um, the main thing is that this, this piece has to be flush against the vertical surface it's going against. And it was, this. my table's not perfect. So I was pretty happy with that. And when the mantle was set on top, um, everything looked pretty good. One edge was a little bit lower, so I'll have to adjust. You could see where the light's coming through on that far left-hand side. So I'll have to ad adjust the, the French cleat on the decorative part of the mantle a little bit to adjust for that. So you can see I permanently glued the cleat to the spacer, and then I'm attaching this one temporarily with brads. I will eventually permanently attach this, but I wanted to be able to adjust it. Um, so that's why that's temporary with black, with brads and that's how that looks. So then I could go through and make this curve. Um, in my shop, the easiest way to do that is to use um, a disc on my angle grinder. It removes material very quickly. The key to doing this is you can see I have marks going around the entire piece and I just follow the marks. The curve obviously is going to help create the curve on the wood. And then I get close enough to the marks and then I can finish it up with a belt sander, which also has a curve on the front. When that's material down, you can see just how nice that lock miter is. It's a solid connection all the way through the piece. And then, like I said, the curve on the belt sander is perfect for stuff like this because I could take um, that angle grinder bit. It's great for moving, removing material very quickly, but um, it removes material a little too quickly. So if I'm doing something as, as that has to be as accurate as this, you could see I took it to about an eighth of an inch to my line and then I use the belt sander to just finish it up. So now with all this in place, I could start adding the trim. Like I said, there's a lot of trim on this piece. This was the easiest trim to make and install. It's this bottom square trim, and then that will go around the entire inner perimeter of this. The trim was actually a little bit difficult because the dimensions include the trim, and obviously that was something I was adding. So it was a constant process of um, adding and subtracting thicknesses based on the trim. So that was, that was a little bit of a challenge as well. And then that one side is done. So I'm gonna show you how I do this side. Now the trim for this, this decorative molding, I make for the pilasters, which will be the next video. So the, how I make that will be in that video. This one was already starting to get a little too long. So I don't do a lot of trim work. So my process is slow and steady for this. You could see I measured out the top one. I made sure it was gonna be flush with the sides permanently attach the, the top, and then I could permanently attach the sides. Really tried to remove glue as I went with this so I didn't have a lot of sanding to do. Once my sides were in place, I can mark and measure for the bottom and then attach that. So I'm showing you these cuts as if they're one cuts, but that bottom piece, I adjusted it at least five times um, on the, the saw to get it right. And then minus some sanding, this is basically what that looks like. So like I said, the next video is going to be working, starting to work on the plasters, which is essentially the two columns.